All right, the clock is now four o'clock CET. So welcome everybody and good morning, good evening to everybody to this 15th top webinar. On behalf of the organizers, it's a, our great pleasure to present our host, Professor Matthias Schemenitz from KU Leuven, who will, uh, who will host this session. So Matthias, please. Thank you, Niels. So first, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to, to host this session. We have um, five talks today by Jamie Guests, Patrick Farrell, uh, Yuan Liang, Eduardo Fernandez, and Victoria Laghi. So thanks to the speakers for uh, willing to share their work in, in this webinar. Um, so the, for the five presentations, we have 12 minutes for the presentation itself, followed by a discussion, Q&A, for three minutes. And then in the end, after the last presentation and the last Q&A, we will have 10 more minutes for further discussion. Uh, the first speaker is Jamie Guest from Johns Hopkins University. So Jamie, can you share your screen? Jamie will talk about element removal strategies for a density-based topology optimization. Jamie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matthias, for the invitation. Um, and thanks everybody for attending. You can see the screen okay? Yep. Good. Yep. Um, so first, let me just acknowledge our, our my co-authors here. Um, Reza Latvi, the second name there, he actually was the one that first started implementing this uh, about 10 years ago, working on nonlinear problems. And since then, in our group, we've kind of been expanding its use to different physics. Um, and that's where sort of Reza and Josephine and Federico have come in um, and just found this approach to be I don't know, in my opinion, a little bit surprisingly robust. Uh, it works very well and, and consistently works well. Um, and as you'll see, it's not really a new idea, but we finally sort of have applied it to enough problems and gained enough confidence. We thought we should bring it back to everyone's attention and, and hence the, the CMAME paper. Um, so the motivation for this work is, is really quite simple. Uh, so in topology optimization, uh, we typically model the entire design domain, which means um, solid and void, right? In the void material, we typically assign some soft material properties, some fraction of the modulus of the solid material. Um, and we do that because it's easy, right? We don't have to remesh and it's very easy for material to reappear in those void elements, which may happen during topology optimization. But of course, as you know, you look at the final product and what's actually manufactured, um, we don't manufacture the voids, right? So why are we modeling them? Um, we're essentially maximizing the computational expense by modeling these soft material regions that don't hopefully play any part uh, in, the, in the components response. Um, perhaps more problematically, for certain problems, you know, if we really push nonlinear behavior or complicated flow problems, um, the optimizer can take advantage of that soft load path, right? So even though it's soft material, it can take advantage of the soft load path by, you know, creating a, a, a load transfer mechanism that, again, even if it's soft, it may play some role in the response. Or in fluids, we may have some artificial seepage through a very low permeability material, right? That won't exist in the actual final project in that product. Um, and so, and, and so that's that's one issue. And also, in terms of things like nonlinear problems, we may actually get instabilities in low volume fraction, low stiffness elements that may derail our solver, right? So, and may derail our optimization. So, for example, under geometric nonlinearities, large deformations, we may get things like element distortions. Um, so, obviously, folks are aware of these problems. People have proposed different schemes. The one that really caught our eye was this paper by Bruns and Tortorelli back in 2003, where really simply they restrain the degrees of freedom of void elements. Okay, so, and we, we really just looked at this idea, leveraged it, tried to improve upon it, and looked at the impact of modern filters and projection methods on this idea. And that's what we'll show today. Um, so the two kind of enabling concepts that allow this method to work, or the, or the reason this method works, are one, are our interpolation models for stiffness. Uh, obviously with things like simp interpolation, when we have low volume fraction elements, we have low stiffness and that stiffness drops more quickly with the higher the penalty in the, the higher the exponent in the SIMP model, right? So as we go towards zero, the stiffness drops rapidly to zero. Um, not only does the stiffness drop rapidly, the derivative of stiffness drops rapidly, right? So you can see for all these different curves, as we approach zero, the slope of that curve approaches zero more quickly too. And that's important for what we're about to show on the next slide. Okay, so stiffness and derivative of stiffness drop slowly as volume fraction goes to zero. The second sort of ingredient here are filters and projection methods, right? And the key idea with these methods, of course, is that a finite element's volume fraction is a function of other things, right? And those other things are located a distance 
away from the element. So in typical projection, if we have these independent design variables, a single design variable talks to many elements over a distance r min. Okay, that single design variable with using the heavy side function has the ability to create a feature of radius r min. Okay, and if we look from the elements perspective, we just flip this cone upside upside down. An element, therefore, is a function of several design variables a distance r min from it. Right. So what that means is again, design variables, you know, not in the finite element space can actually deposit material on that finite element. And those those are the two primary concepts that get this to work. To see that in action, um, we can just look at a simple, simple beam, right? So this is just a cantilever beam where the bottom half of the beam is solid material, the top half is void. If we're, you know, let's say it's close to, it's close to void, let's say it's some very negligible stiffness. You'll notice some lines on this plot. So the, the solid white line is the interface of solid and void in the topology. The dashed lines are just a distance R min from that interface, okay? So the radius of the filter and projection. Um, if we look at, let's focus on the heavy side projection line here. If we look at the energies and derivatives and sensitivities uh, of this beam here for a minimum compliance problem, let's say with an exponent of three and a, and a projection beta term of, of 40. Um, if we look at sort of the unscaled strain energy, which would be basically the energy not multiplied by Young's modulus, we see of course that there's large energy in the top half of the beam in the void elements, okay? But when we look at the true straight energy, right, multiplied by Young's modulus, which again, accounts for the simp interpolation, that energy basically gets wiped out, right? So there's very little actual strain energy in the top half of this beam. And if we look at the adjoint sensitivities, they are likewise zero in that top half of that beam, right? So the, uh, the column here C and the column here D basically say those low volume fraction elements are not contributing to the response and are not contributing to any sensitivity analysis. Their sensitivities are very small. So that makes sense, right? Uh, just based on the simp curves. The second piece of this is E and F, which are the basically filtering and projection. Because those elements on the boundary that do have high strain energy, these red guys here, right? Are then a function inside of a filter right? The, that sensitivity information gets propagated a distance r min from the interface when we look at the derivative of compliance with respect to the independent design variables, okay? And you can think of that as the, the, the filtering and projection operation. And this last, last curve here, basically, if I just sort of step back one, we notice that in, in the true heavy side function, any small value of the independent design variable can create solid features uh, can make solid features appear. So what that means is if the sensitivity information is propagated a distance r min from the boundary, when we then go do projection with that information, right, we can actually project and create material another distance r min from that boundary, right? So even though our strain energies and derivatives are zero in the top half of that beam, which means that we could actually not even model it, right? So if we don't even model the top half of that beam, we can still evolve topology a distance two times r min from that structural void interface. Okay, so that tells us that we don't actually have to model the void, but we can still redeposit material in the void space. So how do we implement this? It's super simple. Um, so we set some threshold value that we, we call structurally insignificant. Um, in the paper, we try a couple of different values like uh, volume fractions of 1%, 5%, 10%, things like that. Um, and so we do a quick check, and if any element volume fraction is less than that threshold, we set it equal to zero. Okay, and if we set it equal to zero, and, and we don't set it equal to rho min, we set it equal to zero. And so then what that means is the stiffness is zero. We don't have to assemble it into the global stiffness matrix if we don't want to. Okay, and then the other check we do is after we've done this process, any degree of freedom that's surrounded entirely by void, you know, newly assigned void, we can actually deposit or place a boundary condition at that location. So if we look at this sort of blue circle in the red in the red body, um, along that interface, these degrees of freedom are still touching solid material. So those degrees of freedom remain active, but these degree of freedom, degrees of freedom out here that are surrounded entirely by void will get boundary conditions, okay? And of course, what that means is we are shrinking the linear system. We have to solve every design iteration. We're no longer having to model those really soft elements, right? And, and potentially numerical instabilities that come along with them. Um, we fully recognize that we are adding a discontinuity into a gradient-based optimization problem, right? That's never a great thing to do, um, but shockingly, it works remarkably well and is, is very robust in all the problems we've considered. Um, so just to show you a few of those, and there's lots more details and examples in the paper. 
Um, this is a simple minimum compliance problem, a 2D minimum compliance problem. And in all these plots, you'll see kind of a reference design, which means we're not doing this approach. Okay, and then you'll see a couple examples with different threshold values. So row T equal to 0 0.01 means volume fractions less than 1% are assigned void, and we can Im impose boundary conditions on those elements if we'd like. Um, you see all the way up to 10%, we get basically the same topology. Um, this curve here and active is the number of elements we're actually modeling as the design evolves. Of course, that decreases in time and decreases about to the volume fraction of the final design. Okay, and as we remove them, we are removing degrees of freedom associated with them, right? So the, again, the size of the system we're shrinking, uh, uh, we're solving shrinks, and that's why you see this bend in this computational expense curve, right? So the cost per iteration uh, is decreasing as we start to remove these elements and, and apply these 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 uh, um, boundary conditions. Um, visually, these solutions are the same. The objective function is also about the same. Okay, you see very little difference in the objective function. And of course, the cost per iteration is decreasing because we're solving smaller and smaller systems. All right, bigger effect in 3D than in 2D. Um, that's minimum compliance. We expect that to be really well behaved. This is an example of an eigenvalue problem maximizing the natural frequency. Again, we use different threshold values and try this approach. We see visually similar topologies. They're not identical. You'll see here a slight difference in this bar compared to the reference design. However, the objective functions are very similar. The frequencies are very similar. Right. Again, more importantly, we see really dramatic savings. This is now an eigenvalue problem where we're depositing boundary conditions. Right. So we're shrinking the eigenvalue problem, which is more expensive to solve. So higher potential payoffs here. Um, you see this jagged curve. Um, this is not an objective function convergence plot where we would not like to see that. This is just the number of elements we're actively modeling. So when we see these drops, it means we're assigning voids and applying boundary conditions. When we see these spikes up, it means material has been redeposited into the void and those boundary conditions have been taken back out, right? We've, re we've removed them. So we see the algorithm is indeed adding boundary conditions and then removing them as material is redeposited into the void domain. And then just one last example here, a buckling problem also found in the paper. The thing I really like about this problem, uh, we're trying to maximize the critical buckling load is this bottom example, All right? So this bottom example actually starts with this bar as the initial guess, which means we are not modeling any of the light blue area. We have boundary conditions everywhere in that light blue area, yet the topology optimization algorithm through the projection operation is able to grow the design out into that void space where we had boundary conditions, All right? So that demonstrates again that the algorithm has the ability to grow into the void space. Oh, and I lied, sorry. One more example of fluids problem, right? We can do this for fluids also, right? It's just the opposite that we apply to when we have solid material, we put in no slip boundary conditions, right? So it's just the opposite of, of solid mechanics where we have solid, we now add no slip boundary conditions. Again, you can see we're removing, uh, we're, we're creating solid material, we're adding no slip boundary conditions. And these blips here are again, void showing up in the solid domain and those boundary conditions getting removed. And you can see that here, right? So we're no longer modeling anywhere in this gray region and you'll see a feature here reappear. And that's because material has been redeposited, void fluid has been redeposited into that domain and then the algorithm gets rid of it again, right? So again, you see these boundary conditions are actually adapting. So in summary, I just want to highlight this idea is, you know, the original kernel of the idea is not ours, right? It comes from Brunson Tortorelli paper back in 2003 to deal with numerical instabilities associated with nonlinear problems. Um, it's, you know, it's very easy to implement um, and, and the, the material is reintroduced purely by the projection and sensitivity operations. We don't have some um, decision rule for how to make the material reappear. It's just totally driven by the sensitivity analysis. Um, if you read the Bruns and Tortorelli paper, they, they mentioned that you can get disconnected structures um, early in the process so that they only apply this rule later on. Um, that's purely effect of, we think, MMA aggressiveness with the asymptotes. So if you tighten down those asymptotes as we typically do with projection methods, you don't get those large steps that create disconstruct disconnected structures. So we haven't seen that effect actually at all. And lastly, we've assigned this to a lot of different problems. Um, so we encourage you to look at the paper for a lot of different examples. Um, and lastly, I always like to say, we've totally introduced a discontinuity, which is terrible for gradient-based optimization, but yet remar works remarkably well. Um, and so, you know, we've gained confidence that this is, this is pretty robust. Um, I'll stop there and thank you. Thank you, Jamie, nice talk. Um, we have some time for questions now, so you can uh, raise your hands to ask questions or use the chat.
And there's already one question in the in the chat. I'll pass it on to you, Jamie. Uh, the question is: If the filter would be applied on the full mesh after solving on the restricted, would that lead to something similar? Yeah. So I think um, I think the question is saying: Do we still um, apply filtering only in the red region here? Or do we apply it everywhere? Um, and the answer is: We don't do anything different with the filtering operation. It's applied over the entire domain, but it's only actually meaningful around in the solid material and around that boundary region, right? Of course, if we filter out in the blue, we're just gonna get blue, right? So, so that's not gonna change things much, um, but we are actually applying the filtering operation out into this blue space, which is why this, this, this information can propagate into the blue. And then again, Heaviside can deposit it actually as real material. Okay, thank you. Um, I think somebody raised his or her hand, but I cannot tell who, maybe Niels, you can. Yes, I can. <laughs> Excellent. So, uh, so thank you, Jamie, for a very interesting talk. So my question is, why do you why do you apply boundary conditions? Why don't you just solve for the for the unknowns that are still free? So and just uh, well, so it's basically the same thing, right? Uh, we're just formalizing it by adding boundary conditions. I think. Um, so we don't we don't actually assemble the full system and and you know bring in those elements of his matrices again. We actually just form the subset of the free degrees of freedom and solve those. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think it's we do that. It's just there's lots of different implementations on how you can actually do that, right? Do you keep the same global stiffness matrix structure and just work on those rows and columns? Do you actually form a new matrix, right? And uh, and the details of the computational savings, of course, are highly dependent on all those details, right, uh, you know, and what solvers you're using and those types of things. Um, and so different implementations, you'll, you'll see larger speedups, obviously. But yes, that's, that's basically what we do. It's just a formalization of that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Then we have a question from Pierre. Um, does it work also with finite, finite volume and fluid mechanics or only with finite elements? So that's a good question, Pierre. We haven't uh, thought about that, but I would imagine um, I don't. I guess I don't see an issue why it wouldn't work for finite volume, but we haven't tried it. If you have an idea why it might not, um, love to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't see any. I don't see any reason it wouldn't. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, and then uh, Mohammed asks: When applying this to stress and buckling constraints problems, does it handle the singularity problem and Fourier sliding modes problem better? Yeah. So that's a great question. So that was actually the motivation for the work. Raised a lot of you. Was a first student working on this was working on plasticity and buckling problems and it and it helped with that substantially and that's actually the motivation for the Bruns and Tortorelli paper originally also is to help with some of those singularities. Um, the what we saw in most problems is yes, the answer is yes to that problem what we with the eigenvalue problem we did see it didn't completely eliminate it. Um, but what it did do when they did appear they basically got wiped out in the next iteration or two. So while it didn't eliminate spurious modes completely for the eigenvalue problem, it, um, let's say, minimized their impact and corrected them more quickly than when we didn't do this approach. And there's actually some nice plots and some nice details in the paper that show from one step to another what happens in that case. Okay, thanks. There are a couple more questions in the chat, but I think we're uh, passing our three minutes. So I propose Great. that we move on to the next speaker and maybe at the end, of the webinar, we can come back to, to the questions that have been asked. Right. So the next Thanks, speaker, Jason. thank you again, Jamie. The next speaker is uh, Patrick Farrell from Oxford University, and he will talk about computing multiple solutions of topology optimization problems. Uh, so, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm Patrick Farrell. This is a picture of me from before I broke my arm. In the middle, there's Yanis John Papadopoulos, my PhD student who just defended his PhD thesis on Friday, incorporating this material and uh, Thomas Surowick in Marburg. So what I'd like to talk about today is about computing multiple solutions of topology optimization problems. Okay, so let's start with an observation that everyone knows that topology optimization problems in general are non-convex. And as a consequence of that, they usually support multiple local minima. If you initialize your optimization problem from a different initial guess, you might get a different locally optimal solution that may be better or worse for the objective functional, may be better or worse from the point of view of aesthetics or manufacturability and so on. So the question that I'd like to ask today is how can you compute multiple solutions of, the, of topology optimization problems so that then you can pick the best one for your subsequent purposes? And the answer that I'd like to propose 
is an algorithm that I'll outline in this talk, which we call the deflated barrier method. Okay, so uh, what is the deflated barrier method? Well, it's the combination of three things, as I'll describe. First of all, it's, it's the combination of barrier terms of, for an interior point style optimization algorithm. Then when we're following the central path at every point on the central path, we're going to use a primal dual active set strategy to solve the first order optimality conditions. And then the extra ingredient in the mix is something called deflation. And deflation is really the new idea uh, in this combination that lets us eliminate known solutions from consideration so that then we can hope that our algorithm will converge to solutions that we don't know. So here's a, a sketch for explaining like I'm five. So here I've got the solution space. So I'm thinking about density-based topology optimization. So I start off with the uniform guess in the top left and I drive my optimization solver to convergence. And here I'm solving a compliance problem and linear elasticity, but that's not so important. I converge to this solution and then somehow I can deflate it away. I can get rid of it. And then I can start my optimization solver from the same initial guess or in the same process. And then I'm going to converge to another solution. And in turn, I can deflate that, find another solution and so on for as long as I have the patience or the time. Okay, and then I keep going until I don't find any more and then I declare victory and go home. So this isn't a way of finding all solutions, all local optima of topology optimization problems, but it is a way of finding lots as we'll see. Okay, so a brief sketch of the approach, and I, I won't go into too much mathematical detail because this talk is so short, but just I wanted to give a flavor of kind of what's involved. So we start off with the Lagrangian for the problem incorporating the objective function and the constraints and PDE constraints. And I'm going to augment this with interior point style barrier terms, the kinds of barrier terms you would use to enforce the box constraints on your density. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do continuation on the barrier parameter, this value mu, the weights in front of my interior point barrier terms. And of course, I want to take that parameter down to zero because that's the actual problem I actually want to solve. So I'm going to do continuation on this barrier parameter. And so think about doing a continuation step from some large value mu plus down to a smaller value mu minus because I want to end up at zero. Okay, so I've got let's say a bunch of solutions, maybe one solution, maybe more at mu plus. So I'm going to use those as initial guesses for the solution of the first order optimality conditions at the new updated parameter value, mu equals mu minus. So because I've got good initial guesses, I'm taking you know, reasonable steps in mu. So this is going to converge very nicely. Okay, once I've continued all the branches that I know, all the branches of the central path, then I deflate all of the solutions that I've already found at mu minus. And this is what modifies the nonlinear problem, the first order optimality conditions to remove the solutions that I already know. And then I can sort of do the continuation step again, but now I'll use as initial guesses, the same initial guesses that I had at mu plus, but if I converge from any of them, I'm going to converge to new solutions that I didn't know before. So this is the part where we discover multiple solutions. And so I'm willing to do a certain number of uh, primal dual active set iterations. And if it doesn't converge in 20 iterations, then I say, okay, there's nothing defined here. And then I move on. So let me draw a sketch of what this looks like. So here I'm drawing the central paths uh, that we've discovered for a compliance minimization problem constrained by linear elasticity. So you should read this diagram starting from the right and going to the left because I'm starting with a large value of the barrier parameter mu and I'm getting towards mu equals zero. So at mu naught, at the initial value of the barrier parameter, there's only one solution to these perturbed optimality conditions. I call that Z naught. And then I'm following the blue branch down as I do continuation in my barrier parameter. And at each continuation step, I'm looking for new solutions. I'm looking for new central paths that I don't know yet. And then at a certain critical value, what I've labeled here mu k, I do indeed find another solution of the first order optimality conditions. And then I continue both of those down to mu equals zero. In this case, we only find two, but of course you could find more solutions if, if they were nearby. Okay, so we're finding multiple branches of the central path. 
So what does it look like uh, in the code? Well, what this we've released some open source software that implements uh, our approach and it builds on top of Phoenix and Firedrake. So the way that it goes is you import Phoenix as many of you will have seen. You construct an object that constructs the mesh, defines the function space that you want to use for your finite element discretization, writes down the Lagrangian and boundary conditions. And then you say, please apply this deflated barrier method uh, to it. So it's quite generic and quite useful. And, and indeed we've applied it both to solid and fluid problems, but you could apply it to other uh, density based topology optimization problems also. So let's see it in action. Well, first of all, let's just give a little bit more details about this compliance minimization problem that I've been describing. So as most people do, I've been using the solid isotropic material with penalization model. Um, and as uh, for the filtering approach here, we've gone for the addition of a Ginzburg-Landau energy that gamma converges to the perimeter of the design. But of course you could combine this approach with other filtering approaches. This is just what was most convenient for us. And when we go through solving the first order optimality conditions and doing the continuation in the barrier terms, we do indeed find two um, solutions of this optimization problem, both of which are locally optimal. There's another uh, very well-known benchmark topology optimization problem in fluids that supports multiple solutions. So if you go back to the original paper of Borval and Peterson, they actually observed the multiple solutions there, which I found really interesting. That's what intrigued me in this issue in the first place. So they propose this problem where we're trying to design the pipes that minimize power dissipation in Stokes flow with inflows on the left and outflows on the right with a constraint that the fluid can only occupy one third of the domain. And with our approach, so the way that Borval and Peterson found the multiple solutions of this problem, of course, was by initializing with different initial guesses, but we can do this now in a systematic manner where starting just from the uniform uh, initial guess that has uh, density one third everywhere, uh, we can systematically find both solutions, both the two independent straight channels, each joining one inflow to one outflow, as well as the monkey wrench configuration that joins the two inflows and forks at the outflows, but has a thicker pipe in the middle and so loses less power. And so the, the double ended wrench is the globally optimal solution for this problem. So here there are only two solutions and we find both of them, that's very nice. But what about, could we construct a topology optimization problem where there are lots of solutions? So let's take the Borval and Peterson benchmark problem and try adding some holes in the domain. So here now I've added these five holes where I'm just removing them from the design domain. So I don't solve any PDEs on these. There's just no possibility of, of putting in a density of one there. And of course these five holes have been placed so as to block both of the channels or all of the channels and the two optimal solutions that we saw before. So now the optimizer is going to have to go around these holes somehow. And of course there's lots of different ways that they could do this. So if you start your topology optimization with the standard algorithm from a uniform initial guess, you might converge to this solution here. So this has a power dissipation of about 60. So we see that indeed the, the pipes have worked their way around these holes in some kind of awkward configuration. But if, if you apply the deflated barrier method, well, you've discovered this solution, the one with J equals 60, but you also discover another one with a lower power dissipation. And then if you keep running it, you find more solutions all to the same optimization problem, all of them locally optimal. And you find more solutions and you find more solutions and more solutions and more solutions. So indeed for this optimization problem, we were able to find 42 uh, local minima uh, before we ran out of time and said, that's enough, let's declare victory and go home. And here we've arranged them in decreasing order of the objective functional. So the best one found is at the bottom right and the worst one found is on the top left. Now, although we've, we found 42 of these, we haven't found them all because of course this system has a Z2 symmetry. And so you would expect the reflection uh, top to bottom uh, of any optimum to also be an optimum. And so we, we're missing some of these. So we know that this search isn't exhaustive. So you can't find them all, but you can find a lot. Okay, and so let's consider a similar analogous problem in three dimensions. So we'll consider a 3D discretization. We're just running this on a workstation. So about 3 million degrees of freedom, but you could go bigger if you had a supercomputer. 
So here I'm going to consider a topology optimization problem subject to Stokes flow with four inflows, four outflows, and I'm going to remove five cubes in the middle of the domain, again, sort of carefully placed to block where the pipes would naturally want to be. And I'll set as usual a volume constraint on the domain. And indeed, as you might expect from the 2D solution, there's lots and lots and lots of different ways that the pipes can bend and warp to avoid the obstacles that we've placed in front of them. So there's one, here's another, lots more besides, they just keep coming. Indeed. And so what I should comment here is that, uh, so here we're solving it somehow an all at once system when we take the first order optimality conditions. This is somehow a, a simultaneous analysis and design type of approach. So the, the key step in getting this 3D example to work was the design of a good preconditioner for the optimality conditions. So that was a, a big chunk of, of John's PhD thesis, but we're able to design a good preconditioner for this problem. And so we're confident now that if we had a big enough computer, you could indeed run this with much, much finer resolution in three dimensions. Okay, so that was what I wanted to say. So uh, the paper describes a strategy for computing multiple solutions of topology optimization problems. It's not the only one, but it's, it's one that uh, we like and we, we think is effective. The essential ingredients are barrier terms, a primal dual active set solver for the first order optimality conditions, and this new ingredient in translation for eliminating solutions that we already know. You can solve large 3D problems if you have good preconditioners, and I'll just offer as a comment that if you really like reduced formulations, as I, I appreciate that many people do, you could also apply deflation to these if you're using Newton type solvers uh, for the optimality problem, for the optimization problem. Okay, and so if you'd like to see more details, please take a look at the, the paper that's cited in the email. There's also some code that's been published and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Patrick, very nice results. Um, there are already a couple of questions in the, in the chat. Uh, the first one from Mohamed Tarek. How does the undeflated version of the algorithm with the augmented Lagrangian method compare to something like IPOct, which I believe uses a Lagrangian method, but not augmented? Um, tell you the truth, it's been a few years since I read the paper about IPOct, and so I, I couldn't comment exactly on the technical uh, details. So I, I can offer one important uh, contrast which is that if you're only looking for one solution and you're doing an interior point style algorithm, you don't need to follow the central path so closely, right? So a lot of what IPOps does is approximately solving the first order optimality conditions in the continuation, but you don't really need to, to get so close to the central path. For us, because we're going to deflate the solution that you found that really needs to be the solution of the perturbed first order optimality conditions. And so we need to do more work in tracking the central path because we actually want to find the point on the central path. So essentially we're doing more Newton iterations at each continuation step than interior point, than IPOPT would do. So th there's a, a cost associated uh, with applying the algorithm, even if you're only looking for one solution. Yeah. Then two questions from Federico Ferrari. The first one is how is deflation actually performed? And then the second one, how, flex how flexible is the method with respect to parameter continuation, for example, uh, increase of SIMF uh, penalization? Uh, I'll answer the second one first. I, I think it's totally flexible. I, I think you could do continuation or do the continuation in the barrier terms for a, a certain physical parameter that you care about and then continue the solutions of the first order optimality conditions in the physical parameter afterwards, I think that would be very effective. I, I think that would work just fine. Or indeed you could combine them in any order you like, do some continuation in the barrier term, do some continuation in the parameter dimension, do some continuation in the barrier term again. Um, as for the, the first question, sorry, can you read it out again, please? How is deflation actually performed? Yes, so, so this is something that um, I was wondering if I would have time uh, to discuss, and I, I thought that I didn't, but maybe I did. Uh, so deflation is extremely easy to implement. So essentially what happens is that we take the first order optimality conditions and we reformulate them as a semi-smooth system of equations in the standard way. And then, so you can think about this as primal dual active set is the Newton method for the, this, system, this system of equations for finding the root of this equation. And when we deflate, what happens is that we multiply 
the, the residual of the system of equations we're looking for the roots of by a scalar, a carefully chosen scalar that blows up as your iterate approaches the root that you already know. So essentially the way the deflation works is by introducing a singularity in the system at the solution that you already know and under very mild regularity conditions, you can prove that this will mean that Newton type methods won't converge there again. And what it actually looks like in practice in, in the code, uh, what happens is that if you were doing a Newton type method, you'd solve a linear system, then you do a line search. Uh, the, where deflation comes in is in between those two steps. You solve the linear system exactly as you do now. Before you do your line search, you do a little bit of post-processing to have the effect of, of solving the deflated system. And then you do the line search with the updated uh, search direction. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I propose that we move on to the to the next speaker now, uh, which is Yuan Liang from uh, Dalian University of Technology. So Yuan, can you share your screen? And thanks again. Thank um, so Yuan will talk about discrete variable topology optimization using sequential integer programming. And this talk is based on, on three uh, publications um, with different applications of, of uh, the same approach. So Yuan, the floor is yours. Okay. Hello? 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 Okay, okay, okay. Yuan, how, how do you have more than one computer on in the office? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe kill the other one. Then. <laughs> so, okay, okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to do uh, this presentation in this top webinar. Uh, the title of this presentation is Discrete Variable Topology of Mission via Sequential Approximate Integer Programming with Trust Reason. This work is instructed by Professor Gong Gong Cheng, and my name is Yuan Liang. The other two collaborators are Xin Yuan and Kai Sun. We are all from Dalian University of Technology. Uh, in this presentation, we focus on the pixel-based topology of the same problem. If the density design variables is equal to one, which means that the corresponding pixel is a material phase. Otherwise, the corresponding pixel is a wall phase. Uh, strictly speaking, the mathematical essence of this problem is a large-scale nonlinear integer programming constrained by PDE. Uh, recently, directly tackling the integer programming problems caused a lot of interest. Uh, recently, Liang and Cheng proposed a sequential approximate integer programming framework to solve the discrete variable topology of machine problem. To show the basic features of our method, let us recall the classic sequential approximate programming in continuous variables. SAP uses continuous sensitivity to construct explicit separable continuous subproblems. And then the subproblems are solved to update the design variables until the convergence is satisfied. SAP can apply mathematical programming into structure optimization, represented by MMA, SAP obtain huge success. In our method, we want to extend SAP framework into SAIP framework. The basic, uh, basic processes of the uh, two frameworks are almost the same, except the related discrete concept. However, SAIP is much less stated in literature, and uh, because some fundamental problems should be solved, here we tend to solve them. Firstly, we transfer the general implicit problem into a sequence of explicit discrete variable problems by the sensitivity. And here we focus on the separable quadratic or linear integer programming sum problems. And then we proposed a canonical relaxation algorithm to solve the integer programming problems. This algorithm can transfer the primal discrete optimization into the dual optimization problem that owns the excellent mathematical properties. As a result, the KKT condition of the dual problem is analytical. So the numerical cost of solving this KKT condition is small. And due to the separability, the dual gap can be tend to be zero, which can guarantee the solution quality. 
At last, we use different uh, more limit strategies to restrict the variation range of these variables. Now I want to show some, uh, I want to show, show some results of the SIP method. First, uh, our method is as efficient as with continuous variable method. So it can solve very large scale problem. For example, the method can solve this sim 3D play, uh, plate problems that owns around 80 million uh, degree of freedom. And the method can obtain the manufacturing design without any post-processing and can obtain the complex different ribs. Besides, the method is uh, flexible in handling the constraints. For example, the method has, can solve the minimum weight design with seven displacement constraints. Besides, the method can directly solve thousands of local infill constraints. I think it's amazing that the discrete variable method can solve so many constraints. Uh, besides, the method is flexible uh, in handling complex of the function uh, that may be on positive or negative sensitivities, uh, such as the compliant mechanism design problem. And due to the clear black and white material layout, we can easily identify and control the geometrical feature. Uh, uh, for example, the method can control the minimum life scale for the material phase and the volume phase. Recently, we successfully controlled the topological invariance during the iteration. Uh, the so-called topological invariance are the OLA and the BD numbers. Our method can also problem and the design dependent heat convention problem. The merits of the method can be concluded as REFC. R is the rationality because it is used in mathematical programming, but not the heuristic way to update the design variable. E is the efficiency because it is efficient like a gradient-based continuous variable method. F is the flexibility because it is flexible in handling constraints and the object functions and maybe problems. C is clearness because it can obtain clear black and white solution. Uh, here we must stress that the reasons of the above merits are also that we observed absor some important techniques from other methods. Uh, all details of the method are shown in the following papers. Uh, in the rest of this presentation, I want to show a theoretical detail of our method. That is the trust reason based more limit strategy. The traditional more limit strategy is a box, box constraint. However, it's not suitable for the discrete variable method. And recently, we proposed a discrete variable more limit strategy that is based on the trust reason method. Uh, the so-called trust reason method transfers the global complex model into a simple model under a certain zone. This JIF shows the iterative process of the trust reason method, where the black circle is the trust reason. If the iterative process is stable, the trust reason can be enlarged. Otherwise, the region should be shrunk. Note that the trust reason method can control the overall variation, but, every, uh, but, but not every component of design variables. So it is very suitable for discrete variables. Therefore, we introduce the trust reason constraint into SAIP framework to formulate sequential approximate integer programming with trust reason. Uh, uh, to be spe specific, the trust region constraint that can restrict, restrict the variation range of design variable by the p-norm is augmented into the integer programming sub -parmos. Here, there are uh, two important questions. The first one is how to choose the trust reason readers. Uh, we can fix the readers or just uh, or dynamically change it. Another question is how to solve the above uh, trust reason based integer programming sub problems. Uh, first of all, under continuous variable, the trust reason constraint is nonlinear and maybe non differentiable. Actually, uh, solving the trust reason model is not a trivial task. Uh, however, under discrete variable, the change direction of discrete variable is definite. So the trust reason constraint is a total linear constraint under discrete variable. Besides, our proposed Tanako relaxation algorithm can solve the multiple linear constraints. So SIPTR can be easily solved. Finally, SIPTR can extend the discrete variable method into complex problems, including the compliant mechanism design, minimum life scale control, and the convective problem. Let us first consider the classic in water mechanism design problems. Here, when we input the force, we want to maximize the displacement at the output position. Here, the artificial sphere model is utilized and the trust reader, reader, readers is fixed. Here, we provide two renderable initial black and white designs. These two initial designs may be the worst design because they don't have any valid uh, load transfer paths. However, our, our method can also optimize the material out to maximize the, the dis dis displacement. Besides, the iterative curves are also stable. 
So we can find that uh, for this problem, even by the fixed readers, SLPTR method is also very robust. Next, we propose a geometrical constraint to control the minimal line scale. Uh, this geometrical constraint is inherited from the constraint pro proposed by Professor Ming Zhongdong. However, uh, due to the disparate variables, uh, the nonlinear uh, half set projection is unnecessary. Uh, besides, uh, due to the disparate variables, the physical meaning of this geometrical constraint is uh, very apparent. Uh, to show this, uh, we investigate a concrete material layout that owns the C member bars, point hinges, sharp corners, and uh, small holes. These two figures depict the geometrical constraint value contributed by the material phase and the volume phase. From these figures, we can find that the C member bars, point hinges, sharp corners, and the small holes that apparently violates the minimum length scale are successfully highlighted. So we believe that if the geometric constant value can be reduced, uh, the minimal length scale can be controlled. So when we introduce the, the geometric constant into SAIPTR, we can successfully eliminate the point hinges. Here, R denotes different uh, requirement of the minimum length scale. From these figures, the red circle can freely move in the structure and the blue circle can freely move around the outer surface of the structure, which proves that the minimum length scale for the material phase and the volume phase are all, satis uh, are, are, are all satisfied. The reviewer of uh, this our this paper commented that these are the first things free compliant me mechanism solution using integer variables and the formal mathematical programming. And this work also gives us inspiration that we can use black and white design to model the geometrical feature. And this geometrical feature may be related to the manufacturable constraints. And we can uh, uh, change it to the mathematical formulation and use our method to solve it. Next, we discuss the simplified convective key transfer design problem. For this 2D rectangular design domain, there is a heat flux boundary, uh, which means that the thermal constantly input into the structure. On the one hand, we want to put the high conducting material to efficiently transfer the thermal by conduction. On the other hand, uh, the cooling fluid flows in the volume phase. Uh, besides, the direction of the cooling fluid is perpendicular to the design domain. As a result, the interfaces between the material phase and the volume phase uh, can also transfer the thermal by the convection. So the interfaces can be modeled by the Newton laws of cooling. Here, H is a convective heat transfer coefficient and is uh, uh, considered to be a constant in our paper. In a word, this problem should consider both the conduction and the convection. However, due to the discrete variables, we can directly identify the convective boundaries. The optimization problem is to minimize the average temperature on the heat flux boundary. Uh, we prove that the, uh, the discrete variable sensitivities can be decomposed by the conduction term and the convection term. And we use the filtered sensitivity to construct SIPTR sample problems to solve this problem. The iterative process and the iterative curves of the objective functions are shown here. Note that the boundary, any boundaries between the black element and the white element is a convective boundary. So this problem is highly dependent with the design variables and our method can successfully solve this problem. Uh, for this problem, we found a very interesting phenomenon. When we use a uh, same sensitivity filter readers for the conduction term and the convection term, we find that the point hinges of the checkerboard pattern cannot be totally eliminated. However, when we use a larger sensitivity filter readers for the convection term, the point hinges of the checkerboard pattern can be totally eliminated. And when we solve this problem by, use, uh, by using a high order finite element model and without a sensitivity filter, the checkerboard pattern also appears. And for this uh, checkerboard material, uh, material layout, we continuously refine the match and find that for the conduction with the convection term, the objective functions can be converged. However, for the pure conduction problem, the objective function cannot be converged. So we can conclude that the checkerboard pattern can expose the most uh, convective boundaries and own the physical meaning, but not the discretization error which is totally different for the traditional compliance optimization problem. And the reviewer of this paper think that our, uh, this contribution is extensively interesting. At last, we want to show uh, some ongoing works in our groups. First, we try to link topology optimization and topology analysis as a discrete variable method. We developed a pro programmable Ola-Bongali formula 
to calculate and control the topological environments. Uh, that is the number of holes. The second, we study the efficient and accurate disk variable sensitivity. Third, we study the reduced order convective problem by the disk variable method. That's all. Thank you very much. Welcome to question or comments. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Ivan. Very impressive results. There are a couple of questions in the in the chat. Um, we have uh, two questions about computation time. Uh, so Joao Moreira asks how the computation time compares to a density method. And Joe Alexander, oh, I can't. Uh, I can't see the how it compares to uh, the TOBS. I can't, uh, I can't listen the voice. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Can you? Uh, tell something. Okay, well, no, I can't, I can't listen to your voice. Please repeat the question. Uh, sorry, sorry. Can you tell something about computation time? Okay. Computation time? Yeah. Okay. Uh, because our method can uh, take advantage of the set probability and uh, uh, the, uh, the numerical efficiency is very excellent. Actually, it's uh, uh, just as efficient as a continuous variable method. I think it's uh, competitive with uh, maybe MMA method. Uh, I think it, this is a, a, to, uh, a diff, di totally difference between the other disk variable method, such as a branch and bound method. Mm -hmm. Because it can use some very good uh, mathematical properties of the topology of addition, for example, the separability. Okay. So it's comparable to MMA applied to a density-based approach. Yes, yeah, so our method is also density-based, sensitivity-based. And um, do you know about the TOBS, topology optimization of binary structures method by Picelli? Okay, I know, I know, uh, okay. I know his, his, uh, How does it compare? We have uh, some uh, collaborations and uh, uh, he used the uh, uh, branch and bound, uh, bound method to solve the uh, disk variable method. And we used the relaxation uh, algorithm to solve the disk variable method. And we all, uh, uh, the, the same thing is that we want to uh, use the discrete variable method to solve lots of things. <laughs> Maybe the fluid problems or uh, complex the problems. Uh, okay. And then a uh, uh, last question of uh, Mohammed Tarek. How sensitive is the algorithm to the trust region size? So okay. Uh, for lots of uh, for lots of problems, we can use the fixed trust region readers. Uh, is enough. Uh, however, for some problems, we should uh, dynamically change it. For example, uh, for the complete mechanism design, if the uh, stiffness of the output spring is small, uh, for example, maybe uh, 0 0.001, and uh, for this situation, the point hedges may be very uh, severe. And uh, if we use a uh, fixed trust reason readers, the iterative oscillation may be appeared. And uh, we can use the, uh, we can dynamically change the trust reason readers uh, by the uh, maybe the merit functions from the mathematical programming and can uh, relieve the uh, iterative oscillation. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot, very nice. So uh, let's move on to the next speaker, which is uh, Eduardo Fernandez from the University of Liège in Belgium. Um, so Eduardo, can you share your screen? Yeah. Yes. So Eduardo will talk about geometric control and topology optimization. Uh, so first on analytical uh, relationships for minimum length scale, length scale in the robust approach, and then uh, on an application of topology optimization to large scale additive manufacturing accounting for the deposition nozzle size. So Eduardo, uh, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Matthias, and hello everyone. So we were invited uh, with Pierre to present these uh, two uh, papers that were mentioned at the beginning. Uh, but I'm going to start first uh, with the motivation, because the analytical relationships for imposing minimum length scale was the motivation uh, from the work that uh, relate, is related to nozzle size constraint in double optimization. So first, I'm going to introduce the, this paper. I'm going to invert the orders uh, of how they were listed. So I'm going to introduce briefly the method that we propose here and the need that we have uh, to uh, develop these relationships for imposing minimum length scale. So this uh, paper, the first one, essentially we were looking uh, for methods to improve printability of optimized designs 
uh, intended for this kind of additive manufacturing technologies, the ones that deposit large amounts of material and therefore they use a big nozzle size. So because if you don't take into account the low resolution of the nozzle with respect to the design space, you might not be able to fill the entire design. And with the method that we propose, uh, we were able to improve printability in the sense that we fill more uh, fraction of the design during the printing process in 2D and in 3D. So I'm gonna introduce briefly the method that we propose here in this paper in the next slides. So we use uh, the density-based framework, the classical density filter, and the nowadays is the classical heavy side projection, this one, that is controlled with the threshold eta. And we obtain three uh, fields here, the dilated, intermediate, and eroded design. So we use these three fields in the robust formulation proposed by Professor Sigmund, uh, where we optimize the worst case scenario. In this case, is compliance minimization subject to a volume constraint. Uh, we also use uh, maximum size constraints in the form of uh, local volume constraints applied in omega regions. In the omega regions are these uh, annular uh, domains in 2D or a spherical shell in 3D. And if we apply the maximum size in different fields, we uh, scale this omega region with respect to the field that we want to constrain. So in this paper, we present a, a parametric study where we show results when we constrain the road design, the intermediate design and the delayed design. All of these are compliance minimization problems. The only difference is where we apply the maximum size. And the condition that we retain in our method is the second one. So if you apply compliance minimization subject to a volume constraint and maximum size constraint in the intermediate design, you, you generate uh, uh, structures in the intermediate design composed of bars, and the road design is also composed of bars, but the delayed design is merge the bars. If you have parallel bars, more than one, you will merge them. So that's uh, the interesting aspect that we used in our paper here. So I'm gonna retain these three designs in the next slide. And those are shown here. Yeah, here also highlighted three sections ABC that are illustrated here. So uh, in the middle, we have the intermediate design that is constrained in size. And therefore we have two bars that, that are separated because of the maximum size constraint. And it's also the case in the road design. But because of the dilation projection, we merge those bars, and that's what we interpret as a material bed. Uh, for example, in the one process, wire arc additive manufacture. So here, the the design intended for manufacturing would be the dilated one, and the user-defined geometric uh, input would be the size of the deposition nozzle. This one. So everything fine up to here, I think the method is quite simple to understand, but however, there are some practical difficulties when you try to implement this. Uh, one of them is that if you don't select properly the projection parameters, you might get some bars that cannot merge, be merged in the direction projection, or you might get some bars that overlap in the direction projection. So that's what uh, was one of our difficulties in the, in the implementation procedure, because we had to tune uh, a lot the parameters to get a perfect bonding here. So in the paper uh, that we published, we propose a methodology to obtain the projection parameters, meaning the filter radius, the projection, the road intermediate delayed design, the maximum size as a, uh, as a function of the user input that is the size of the deposition nozzle, meaning the, the radius of this circle. I won't explain that in detail. 
but briefly speaking, we provide uh, values or, or we define predefined values for all of this, and we have to find uh, the dilation projection. So this is the, the tricky value that we have to find. So um, in order to uh, reduce the tuning of parameters in this procedure, we had a look on the different approaches in the literature that relate all of these parameters. And that was the motivation to develop the second paper that I'm gonna describe now. So in the literature, uh, the work that we found that, that relates the, the threshold parameter, the filter radius and the minimum length scale was uh, this one proposed by Sigmund and Fien. So they, in the appendix of this paper, they provide analytical expressions that relate uh, all the parameters that, we, uh, that I mentioned. Uh, however, um, they provide equations considering a symmetric projection with respect to the intermediate design, meaning the distance uh, between the eroded threshold to the intermediate threshold and the intermediate threshold to the dilated threshold is the same. So we needed something not symmetric. So like this one, and that we didn't find it in the literature. And also we were requiring uh, to get the dilation and erosion distance. So that's why uh, we were forced to further develop the equations or the methodology proposed by Professor Sigmund and Kim. So essentially what we did is to take the same approach as the reference, we assume a 1D continuous uh, design field of prescribed size H. We apply the continuous form of the density filter. Uh, we obtain this Gaussian distribution after applying the filtering. And the trick here is to find the coordinates Xi for a prescribed threshold uh, eta i. So once you find the, the coordinate x i, you can compute the length of the projected field at the threshold at uh, eta i. So you have to work a little the, the equations here uh, by hand, and you will get a set of equations that relate the minimum length scale, the filter radius, the projection threshold, and the erosion threshold or the dilation threshold. So you, you get a set of equations for the solid phase, for the void phase, and uh, with a range of uh, applicability for each one. So we also, so to validate this set of equations, just to be sure that we were in the correct path, uh, we also compare the solution uh, with the discrete uh, approach that is proposed by one. So here, essentially, we apply the same procedure, but now in a discrete uh, 1D design space. So here we discretize that by elements. We filter, project, and with, mean, uh, with different threshold values, we get this Gaussian distribution that represents the filter field. This is for the solid phase. This is for the void phase. So we compare both, and we got a almost perfect match. So we, with that, we validate that the, at least the analytical procedure uh, was correct. And uh, of course, for the comparison between the analytical and the numerical one, uh, we use here a, a very refined discretization for this discrete approach in order to mimic a continuous field. That's why we have a almost perfect match here. Um, this is the classical graph that you find in the literature related to minimum length scale. This is the threshold projection, the, yeah, the erosion threshold, the minimum length scale, the filter radius. So that's already found in the literature, but this is what is new in the literature. So here we provide a graph that relates the minimum length scale uh, with the erosion and dilation threshold. And here you can see the, the effect of defining a non-symmetric projection with respect to intermediate design, because if you define a symmetric projection with, intermediate, with respect to the intermediate threshold, you get uh, this uh, um, highlighted in uh, yellow, this zone. So 
meaning that the minimum size of the solid and the void states are, are the same. So our contribution would be all points that are outside this uh, line. You, you can impose different sizes uh, for the solid and void states. And also we, as we were requiring the erosion and dilation uh, distance, we also provide the graphs or equations at, or, and also we provide modular codes if you want uh, to, get, to get a fast uh, uh, result of the projection threshold that you would like to implement. So we also discuss a little the scope and limitations of these uh, approaches, the analytical and numerical one, of course, the and what we observe among many sources of error that the most significant one is the rounding error. So, if you have a very coarse discretization, the analytical and numerical approach won't give a very good approximation. And of course, if you start to refine the match. Uh, as in this case, you reduce the, the rounding error. This is like the most dramatic case that we, we found. And also what is interesting to note is that um, we developed the equation for a 1D from a 1D design domain, continuous and discrete. Uh, but we also compare the numerical approach using a 2D circle or a 2D bar. So we filter this bar and we measure the size for different thresholds. So what we observe is that uh, the 2D bar and 1D case give very similar results. As you can see here, this is the filter field. You can see the Gaussian distributions be, uh, very similar. But if you consider the 2D circle, for instance, uh, you have a significant difference. So. The conclusion here is that if you want to use the set of equations we provide from that are uh, that are derived from a 1D design domain, if you want to use those equations to impose the minimum thickness of bars or the minimum thickness of plates in 3D, so you can have a very good approximation. But if you want to use those set of, set of, of equations to impose the minimum size of cavities, you might expect some uh, differences uh, with respect to our formulation of that is based on 1D. So we also validate that on, on 2D and also with the same conclusions, if you refine the match, you get a, a control on the error. And at the end, that was the motivation of this work, we validated uh, the set of equations and procedure with the maximum size constraint um, that um, was the main uh, interest for us. So I don't have uh, time, I guess, for a uh, conclusion. So uh, here I finish my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Eduardo, for a, for a nice presentation. Um, I don't see questions yet in the chat or there, but somebody is uh, raising his or her hand. Niels again. Niels, please. Niels is applauding, but I He's have applauding. a question. <laughs> uh, other questions? Yeah, I have a question on, on page five or six. Um, and first of all, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, Maybe yeah, there? if I look at uh, page five, uh, page five. Uh, yeah, if I look at the shape on the top left, uh, on, on that corner, it's kind of, the bar is not very straight. So it's like a curved. Uh, maybe it's best if I can annotate. Uh, there? This one? Oh, us, uh, okay, yes. Uh, could you explain why this is happening? And... Uh, um, yes, I, I think, I think it, it is related to the minimum size of the void phase, uh, uh, I think, uh, because as the minimum size of the void phase is significant, it's not possible to get a sharp angle in the connection of two bars. Uh, uh, I think that's, uh, that's the reason of that uh, curved zone and gray elements around this this area and of this zone, yes. 
I think yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay, um, I think we should move on to the last speaker uh, in order to end up more or less in time. Uh, so uh, thank you again, Edwin. Uh, the last speaker is uh, Victoria Laghi from the University of Bologna. She will also focus on um, large scale additive manufacturing, in this case, wire, wire and arc additive manufacturing. And the focus is on topology optimization or the optimization of the topology, but also the printing orientation of, of these elements. So, Victoria, the floor is yours. Oh, sorry. Thank you for the presentation. So, I'm Vitara Laghi. I'm a postdoc fellow at the Structural Design Department at the University of Bologna. And today I'm going to present to you the simultaneous design of topology and printing orientation of elements produced with Warnark additive manufacturing. So, it's pretty much linked with the kind of what Eduardo was presenting before. Um, so the application of metal additive manufacturing in construction has started a, a decade ago, and the first explorations were limited to small connectors realized with high powered uh, based printing techniques for architectural appealing structures. Uh, and only from 2017 on, a technology has been developed to scale up the printed parts up to the realization of real skip footbridge entirely realized in 3D printed steel. This technology is referred to as Warnark Additive Manufacturing, acronym WAM. It's a weld-based additive manufacturing technology which makes use of off-the-shelf welding equipment mounted on top of large robotic arms, able to print pieces several orders of magnitude bigger than the printer itself and up to several meters span and a few meters high. Two techniques have been developed, the so-called continuous printing, which is the layer-by-layer -layer deposition on the left-hand side, and uh, it, uh, it is able to realize continuous shell-like elements and the so-called dot-by-dot printing, which is the one here on the right-hand side, in which drops of metal, uh, metal are printed one on the other to realize rods and lattice-like elements, but also grid shells. So the main advantages of these technologies are the fast production of large parts, which ideally has no geometrical constraints in shape and size and high structural resistance. But on the other hand, there are several open issues to investigate, which are like the lack of material characterization, the lack of mechanical and geometrical characterization, and the lack of core structural design procedures. So in order to evaluate the mechanical performances of one produced stainless steel, first, the material has been experimentally characterized through microstructural analysis carried out by the metallurgical department at the University of Bologna, and also through monotonic tensile tests on machine specimens to evaluate the possible influence of the anisotropic um, layer by layer deposition. And the tests were monitored with LVDT, extensometers, and digital image correlation. So moving to the results, the megastructural analysis here on the left-hand side revealed the preferential orientation of the grain growth perpendicular to the deposition layers and the specimens cut at three different orientations. So the longitudinal at zero degree, which are basically along the printed layers, the transversal directions, which is perpendicular to the printed layers and the diagonal, which is at 45 degrees. And they have three different orientations of the grain microstructure, which affects the mechanical properties of the material. So indeed, the tensile test results reveal a marked anisotropy of the key mat uh, material properties, especially in terms of yarn modulus, for which there is a huge difference with respect to the, um, the, the relative printing direction, but also to the conventional material. So for example, for the transversal direction, there is a 60% decrease of the young modulus with respect to the conventional value for uh, standard stainless steel, whereas for the diagonal specimen, there is a 25% increase. So overall, the yielding and the ultimate tensile strength have also an isotropy, but that is like limited with respect to the elastic properties. So we also investigated uh, a little bit more in detail the elastic uh, properties of this material. And so the anisotropic behavior has been investigated also in terms of the Poisson ratio through the DIC results. So through the digital image correlation monitoring system. Um, and these could be uh, able to uh, evaluate the full strain of, uh, of field during the tensile test. So the results reveal values of Poisson ratios 
higher than the standard reference for stainless steel with a marked difference between the longitudinal and the transversal strain. So from the um, experimental results, we actually um, found out the relationship between the Poisson ratios and the Young modulus, which is a symmetrical relationship as this one. Um, and uh, uh, actually, sorry, from the modeling, um, we actually found out that uh, the, the Young modulus and the Poisson ratios taken at the two perpendicular directions, so the transversal, which is perpendicular to the printed layers, and the longitudinal, which is along the layers, uh, suggest the orthotropic nature of warm stainless steel. So from these values, the compliance matrix was calibrated, accounting for this relationship. The resulting one orthotropic elastic model allowed to derive the angles with respect to the printing layers at which the young modulus and shear modulus have maximum and minimum values. So the results show that the maximum values of young modulus were at 42 degrees plus, of course, each uh, 90 degrees with respect to the printing layer, while the maximum shear was derived at zero degrees and 90 degrees. And both maximum values for warm stainless steel, and both young modulus and shear values were 50% to 100% higher than the standard value for the conventional stainless steel. So the warm orthotropic elastic model could be adopted to engineer the warm material and thus design different printing inclinations based on the needs of the structural members. So this is why we came up with the design of a two-dimensional structural elements for one formulated uh, both in terms of, let's say, the, um, a problem dance, the, the problem in density and in printing direction. So it's formulated as a displacement constraint minimum weight prob problem by a distribution of the autotropic material. So raw is, of course, the minimization unknown that governs the density. Oops, sorry. Um, and uh, sorry, uh, and then theta is actually the unknown that describes uh, the relative printing direction. So we assume that the printing direction can be uh, changed, but it's fixed uh, along the fabrication of the entire element. So the entire element is printed with the same uh, printing direction. Uh, the variable that governs the orientation um, is, of course, uh, the um, uh, let's say an additional unknown with respect to the conventional the displacement constraint uh, problem, and the conventional same uh, method is modified to handle the autotropic feature. So the optimization problem is solved by mathematical programming, so adapting the uh, method of moving asymptotes, the MMA, and at each iteration, the minimizer provides the updated set of optimization unknowns as the current values of the element densities and the value of the, of the additional variable theta, which covers the printing directions. And the adjoint method is used to, to compute the sensitivity of the controlled displacements. Uh, so the first design example here is the cantilever plate with concentrated vertical load at the extreme. And uh, first, uh, the optimal design uh, are derived uh, for the three fixed uh, main printing directions, so the longitudinal, the transversal, and the diagonal, and compared with the conventional stainless steel. And then the simultaneous design of both the optimal the layout and the printing orientation is computed. And so uh, the, the detection was that uh, the optimal printing direction was uh, at 29.5 degrees and 150.5 degrees, which, uh, uh, for which there is a reduction of 40% of material used. And then the second design example is a simply supported plate with a concentrated load at the mid span. And again, first, uh, there was just the optimization of the layout based on the three uh, principal uh, printing directions, L, T, and D with respect to the conventional stainless steel. And then the simultaneous uh, uh, optimal uh, layout and printing direction, which was detected at 33.5 degrees and 146.5 degrees. So in conclusion, warm stainless steel has been experimentally characterized in terms of the orthotropic plane stress model and using the topology optimization, different layouts uh, resulted from the printing direction. So optimal layouts are also found in conjunction with the printing directions and the future uh, developments can see the application of three-dimensional cases and extensions to include also local and global mechanical constraints. 
Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Nice result. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Are there questions? I don't see questions in the chat yet. <laughs> there was a hand raised. Matthias, yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, first of all, thanks for the interesting talk and the remarkable uh, anisotropy uh, that you observe in this material. Thank so you. My, my question is, uh, the, the anisotropy was found in, in a, a test structure which looked like a wall. Uh, but in the topology optimization, you get holes in the wall, basically. You get a different geometry. And yeah. I would imagine that the, the temperature uh, history during the, the printing of the part is quite affected by whether it's a wall or where you have holes in, in certain places. Have you uh, have you already investigated if you still get the same anisotropic uh, properties uh, in these uh, topology optimized structures? Yeah, no, uh, that's a very interesting question. So I think there is a, a still like a lot of investigations that need to be done. So. Um, we actually uh, investigated the anisotropy of both the machine specimens. So I was like rushing a little bit because, of course, like this is a summary of a, a huge uh, um, work. I mean, uh, this is actually part of my PhD. So it's like a three years uh, project as well. And um, but yeah, we we actually uh, characterized the anisotropy for both the, the machine specimens and the as built ones. So uh, actually, like the Geometrical irregularities uh, in, like, for example, also like the post processing did not affect the uh, anisotropy. So I'm not expecting huge modifications uh, uh, for the holes because, like, I see that it's actually a feature that is like intrinsic in the microstructure. So it really depends on the layer by layer deposition strategy. So, like, every time there is like actually a layer by layer growing, then like there is these uh, columnar grains of microstructure that are the one that mainly govern the, um, the, the let's say, the elastic uh, properties. Uh, I should also mention that stainless steel itself, like from the microstructural point of view, the, the, crust, the crystal, the um, Yes, the microcrystal of the stainless steel has actual like preferential and the um, anisotropy. Um, it, um, I'm trying to get like the proper words, uh, elastic constants. So like uh, they have like, the, let's say the, the microcrystal has uh, um, it in itself uh, um, preferential directions for different stiffness. And so this is actually like, let's say, uh, bigger crystal of stainless steel that is like growing from the this layer by layer deposition but i agree i would love to actually implement the strategy and see if it's actually like if there should be some iterations and calibrations of the model from the fabrication yeah it would be great <laughs> yeah That's i would love to <laughs> thanks thank you okay, we have uh, time for more questions I have a question on the extension to the 3D case. So in 2D, it seems logical that you use a single variable to represent the, the layer directions. Yeah. In 3D, you could change uh, the direction of the layers and within the layers, the directions of the rows of material, in fact. So you would have much more design variables. How would you cope with, with that? Yeah, uh, so that's a very uh, interesting question. Well, but uh, luckily for me, I have uh, Professor Brugge within the team. So I, <laughs> I actually expect that <laughs> he can know better how to handle like multiple uh, <laughs> variables and constraints. But jokes aside, um, actually we are trying to uh, scale up step by step. So the next step will not be to like fully be 3D, but actually to have like, let's say shell elements uh, of like, imagine like I type or H type beams in which like you actually can still work on the 2D. So like you can still work on plates, but at the same time, like each plate can be, um, let's say um, fabricated with its own uh, direction. So we are first uh, trying to actually separate the problem into like multiple simple problems, uh, simple 2D problems and assemble it in a 3D. But then like, of course, like the, the step forward would be to just uh, go 3D. But for that, like from my perspective, we also need like a step um, further and also scale up into a 3D orthotropic model. So like the plane stress model is not like 
to be accounted anymore. Like we of course need like multiple um, to increase the matrix. So like we need multiple iterations from also the experiments. Yeah, I see. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions for uh, Victoria? Or maybe for the other speakers, because now we have the five or 10 minutes for the general discussion. Let me just interrupt. I have a question from uh, James Guest, if it's possible. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for whole organization. And James, uh, did you solve any uh, ester space uh, uh, problem, op topology optimization problem, when uh, the boundary actually, the change of the boundary has a very huge impact in the actually the stress uh, fluctuation and change of the stress in the boundary? Stress, uh, like stress constraint kind of stuff. Yes. So good question. Yes. So only, um, so the only thing, so obviously with the buckling problem, we have stress represented and then in some of the plasticity work, we, we did that's captured, um, but we haven't done it. We haven't applied it to things like stress constraints. Um, but certainly when we have sort of yielding develop on the surface, right, then the evolving boundary is going to change that behavior. Um, so so I, I guess we haven't looked as closely as to what it actually did to the optimized design or the performance. We saw the designs change and things, but they, we, they sort of converged to solutions that we that made sense to us. And and behave, you know, with optimized better properties than than previous solutions we have. But I guess I haven't looked that closely at um, mm -hmm. how that tiny detail changed the evolution of the topology or something like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. James. Thanks for the question, Alan. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? Maybe I have one short question for you as well, Jamie. Um, so the approach that you propose seems like a very quick win because as you said, it's, it's easy to implement. Are there disadvantages as well? Sure, so well, so my disadvantages is a discontinuity, right? <laughs> Which makes me very, very uncomfortable uh, that we're changing sort of the boundary conditions on the fly. And, um, and but what's, what has been shocking to me is that it has worked um, so well up to volume fractions of, uh, threshold volume fractions of 10 or 15%. Um, it may work higher. I just am very uncomfortable pushing it past that point, right? Because it just seems like it shouldn't work beyond that point. Um, but but other than sort of like the bookkeeping of you know having to track the artificial boundary conditions versus the real boundary conditions, and um, which I don't think is is a very big deal. Uh, I think to me the biggest risk is that you are adding this discontinuity. Um, and so I can imagine in some cases, although we haven't really seen it yet, that it could it could cause problems in that sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. Claire, you have a question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I would have liked to ask a question to Mrs. Victoria Langi. Uh, my, one, one question that is inspired by your design, maybe, <clears throat> that the constructing layer by layer and plane by plane is maybe the right things because we have robots. Why not thinking about designing uh, curved surfaces by curved surfaces to have bended curves or bended plates of constructions? to have your uh, right orientation maybe everywhere in the system. What do you yeah, believe about um, that? Well, um, that's very interesting. So I think that um, for sure it's going to be like an interdisciplinary effort. So I would uh, actually, um, I'm currently struggling with the, um, let's say with actually the fabrication of the, um, of one so like one one point is to, act to to design for it but the other like the all other work is to actually fabricate so it's still like to me it's still a layer by layer deposition in a sense because like even though like you're planning to like uh build curves uh, it's still like a layer like a curved layer but it's still a layer so it's still like this growing process so i'm expecting to have still like uh anisotropy uh even in uh in the curved uh, parts so but again i think that's like there's so much uh, um work yet to do uh related to women it's uh, really really interesting and um honestly like i really um enjoyed also like your presentation on your work because like i think that we should like investigate on such multiple layers of um of problems that like there there might be a room for uh investigations on like 
many different aspects. So, so I totally agree. Like we should investigate and like have some trial and errors uh, also based on like the fabrication. So like just uh, not a simple design uh, process, but also like an iterative process between design and fabrication to see if what we expect, it's actually what it's going on <laughs> in reality. Thank you very much. Let's, no, thank let's you. keep in touch. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> yes, I would love to. Would love to. Thank you so much. And then Niels also has a question, maybe the last one. Perhaps the last one. Well, first of all, thanks to all the presenters for some excellent talks. My question is for you, Yuan. It's about how have you challenged your approach for the very low volume fraction limit? Because I would imagine for like for BESO and other discrete approaches going to like single percent or two percent, uh, sorry, uh, limits of volume fraction could pose a problem. So is this something you have looked into? We can try the uh, low, vo low, low volume fraction. <laughs> you want two percent? We try. We try. We try. We try. <laughs> so, uh, I'm looking forward to working. see the outcome of that test then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so we've reached one hour and a half. So since one of the nice features of these webinars is that I don't take too long. I, with that in mind, I, uh, I would like to wrap up here. Uh, so thank you again to, to all the speakers for these nice presentations. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me to, to host this session. And Niels of June, I assume that one of you wants to close this session. Yeah, Matthias, uh, thank you for organizing the session today. I think it's, uh, it is wonderful. Uh, all the talks are on time. The talks are interesting. and. Uh, also the discussion are very intensive. So it's really uh, fulfills the purpose of uh, having a webinar to, to collect everyone. So thank you for your organization. Uh, our next webinar will be organized by Professor Yi Min Xie. So it will be on the same time next month. So welcome to join next time. And uh, with this, I conclude the session today. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you all. Bye.